As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. The following conversation with Andrea McGinty took place in Roxbury, New York on January 9th, 2022. Andrea McGinty is an artist and writer based in New York. Her sculptures and collages made from ordinary mass-produced objects act as totems of consumer profiling, registering shopping as an emotional quest for such elusive ideals as domestic safety, wellness, and connection with nature. There was a word that came out in the press release for their, your show coming up at Sun, Sunny Gallery in New York. Um, that, that was a magpie, which I think is kind of a nice word. I didn't write the release for this. Renee Delash, who's a wonderful artist and writer, wrote it. And mm -hmm. I, too, when I saw that description, I was like, ah, how beautiful. Because mm -hmm. um, it does make a lot of sense. And even if it's not the way, I do some kind of collecting of objects and some things I'm like seeking out specific things, but I always kind of want the sculptures to feel as if like you happen upon me or the person who's making them like in their home and they've just been like shuffling around all the objects in their right. house crazily right. for months. And so that description seemed perfect. Like these little kind of compulsive collecting, mm. reorganizing, moving. I've noted a lot of artists doing this like assemblage where it's kind of br bricolage assemblage. It's found, ob found materials, common materials, new configurations. And I, I've thought for a long time that it really just references like consumerism, you know, all the stuff yeah. in the world that's made. Um, but I, I've started increasingly thinking about it as almost kind of post-apocalyptic and maybe it's the negative space <laughs> I'm in at this point as if, you know, the, the world has kind of shattered and instead of instead of making things there's no art store anymore yeah and so you make things out of the stuff at hand Thinking that's around yeah i mean i think that it's definitely start like that that way of working the kind of found object assemblage has definitely been around for a while now and i think in the beginnings a lot of people were going through it like with the ideas of commercialism and capitalism mm -hmm. and buying objects and well, I think that's definitely still in there. For mm -hmm. me, it's like a, in, a little bit in the backdrop or in the idea of less of like making a comment about purchasing and more of at this point, we, especially as Americans, we shop, we purchase and right. it's beyond, it's like such ingrained in who we are and how we live. Yeah, um, yeah, no, it's, it's almost like taking control of the algorithms that already have these pro consumer profiles yeah, of us, right? Yeah. And just saying, okay, this is my identity. Yeah. I buy a lot of cat litter. Yeah, and, uh, this is, yeah. <laughs> and I do think a lot, I mean, I'm, I make very physical objects, but I do think a lot in the realm of the internet um, mm -hmm. in the way that I just, not in like a super, I'm not like a super technological person, but in the very base way that we use it regularly, like mm -hmm. going on Instagram or shopping on Amazon and that I, I do tend to look at and pay attention to that like algorithmic of like, almost like a portrait of myself that mm -hmm. it's giving back to me of mm -hmm. in good ways and bad, embarrassing ways, you know, <laughs> of really? what an algorithm looks at me and what I do mm -hmm. online and what it, it, thinks of me. Yeah, no, and instead of being kind of helpless and passive in, in the way that the, the sort of system looks at looks at us, you can start to kind of mess with it in yeah. some ways. I mean, you can um, be surprising, you can be spontaneous, you can change that perception either through satire or um, the reconfiguration of objects. Right? Yeah, yeah, I found a lot even just through my own like seeking out materials for sculpture, because some of them are things I collect, but a lot of times I'll like have a concept or like an idea that I'm generally working with and a body of work and then I'll be like, okay, artificial, like this new body of work has a lot of different artificial food, vegetables. Right. Um, and so I start seeking those out, but I'm searching them in the same way that I'm also searching for right. things that I need for my home or directions to places. And so those start getting intertwined in my own algorithm is like, and it is, it is what I'm purchasing, but it's also like, I'm not in my own home using a lot of plastic things or artificial fruit, but it's now 
that's like who the computer thinks I am. You know, for, <laughs> forgive me for referencing the ridiculousness of some of it, the way it turns out, but I love reading the descriptions. They have titles, proper titles, your sculptures, but also too the, the uh, medium description is always like <laughs> artificial yeah. lettuce, uh, cat litter container, um, you know, duck decoy, things like that. Yeah, for me, I think a lot about those the material that goes into it. I like listing those materials in a way that there is a humor with it and there's you know conceptual conceits but also it's like each part of it is important. One of the series that I like the best is, is these um, coolers like a playmate mm -hmm. cooler you know put your, put your beer in it but you um, make candles out of them mm -hmm. which which is funny but then you also embed things in them like uh, things that are already referencing preservation maybe. I like this sweet spot between there's like a humor to it, there's a silliness, there's, but there's also sometimes like a sadness or like, mm -hmm. a, you know, there's like an emotional depth with the objects, but you're kind of in this pull back and forth of, right. and you can like recognize, like I like to work with things that you go in and you're like, this, 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 I can tell what the materials are. And some people can kind of go through that quickly and be like, wow, oh. but most of the time I think people are like, oh, a cooler, but then, something's in it, but why is that in there? And then you kind of start spending a little bit of time with that. The cooler itself is something to preserve things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's such a fundamental human urge is like through photography yeah. or um, any, all the ways we memorial, we try to keep things. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's something I definitely, between the sculpture, but also the materials I use, or I've been doing some, a lot of stuff with photography mm -hmm. in the ways of things that are almost like playing with that idea of preserving and elevating things, but also taking things that are kind of lighter. Like a lot of the photos I use will be, some of them I'll take intentionally, but a lot of them are just snapshots I'll take. And you're not afraid to add things to the photos. I mean, photography tends to be such a kind of pristine medium, like the fine art print and the beautiful frame and all that, but you'll print them on fabric. And then yeah. one thing you do that I think is really funny and interesting too is the self, with self storage, like there'll be some yeah, sort of plastic yeah. sleeve. <laughs> I like to play right. between those like high low like proper art mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. kind of yeah utility yeah exactly what I noticed in a lot of them is um in the most recent ones especially is a kind of combining of of references to nature with references to more sort of plasticky yeah. um, industrial produced things yeah yeah I've been playing a lot with that kind of like real and fake and the, definitely I mean I think I personally, but it seems like a lot of people in the past few years have had kind of a realize with the pandemic, especially people in New York and apartments, realize mm -hmm. like a huge disconnect from nature. Mm -hmm. um, and now I live in like a pretty rural area. And so it went from like city life to then, mm -hmm. like completely mm -hmm. enveloped in nature, yeah. <laughs> you know, and really like those kind of clashing or like kind of smashing together. So it's definitely been something that I've thought of and a lot of thought a lot about sort of like health and food and well-being and um, in past work the nature was maybe danced around but not in it so much but that's like mm -hmm. such a huge part of mm -hmm. playing back and forth between those the real and the fake. I'm glad you mentioned well-being because I, I, I was reading some of your writings today um, and, and they are almost I think they're satires of of well-being or that kind yeah. of article in, say, in some ways <laughs> sort of how, how to you know self-care how to at that yeah, tone but you write in that genre very well yeah right? thank you yeah I think it comes from a place of like mm. I'm a person who you know I like wellness things I like health in some ways like I am it's sometimes it's like a parody of my own interests but I also looking at it from the inside, you know, I don't know about necessarily direct critique, but kind of right. having a little fun and dancing around what is actually going on with, but I like that style. I have a very, like, a, I mean, it, it translates to my artwork, I think as well, but mm -hmm. I have a very, my writing style is like very hyperbolic and I like to be a little bit over the top and ridiculous. Well, what's amazing about it is it passes as, as legitimate, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> which, which is, which is happy. the artwork as well. It's a little bit of a Jeff Koons thing. Maybe it's like, yeah. you know, elevating kitsch, but never breaking character, always saying that I think it's just beautiful. Yeah. You know? The name of your show that's opening it, that's honey, is called Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this must have something to do with, you know, American mythologies or something like it that. It does, yeah. I mean, the title comes, it's from a lot of different places. It, um, a lot I was thinking, making the show, thinking a lot about 
in a very loose way and in a very personal way, like America. You know, we've talked over the past few years with our political sphere. There's a lot of like, what is America? Who's American? Who's the right American? Is it like mm -hmm. the Midwest? Is it the coast? Is it, you know, is it like left or right and all of this overarching? And I think that, you know, I tend to like, you know, believe in nuance. And I think things mm -hmm. are all a lot more complicated than they seem, but I was thinking about that a lot. And um, I was raised by, I'm born and raised in America, in Florida, which is another crazy American yeah. place. Right. <laughs> My mother uh, was born, she's from Finland. And so I think oh. I was raised in a very American place, but also I have a little bit of a, my mother's kind of sense of humor and sensibility mm -hmm. with things. And so um, kind of early, not early in the pandemic, kind of midway through once winter hit of the first stretch where like, oh, let's hunker down and kind of watch some movies. And I had never seen a lot of the Clint Eastwood, uh, mm -hmm. like the cowboy movies, the Westerns. And so we started watching those and I was like immediately in love with them. I love those films and I love his filmmaking. And I feel like I really connect to that idea of like really thinking about America, like capital A America. and. Mm -hmm our own real experience to it and what is the real, but also I like that, the like uncanny, there's like, a, you're looking at like an American Western, it's like on this beautiful coast in Spain and there's all these <laughs> actors that are clearly right. not, you know, like cowboys mm -hmm. and there's like a strain, you know, it's, you're, it's, there's like an uncanny strangeness that mm -hmm. I really responded to that I think in some ways loosely connects to how I think about I mean, the biz work bizarrely I enough, I mean, it, it's a good description of America as a, as a fantasy that's only kind of like thinly veiled in yeah. America. Yeah, and also like Clint Eastwood is an interesting character because he's for, like a conservative right. in Hollywood and a lot of people, there's things to criticize, but I also like, re I, I read a biography on him and mm -hmm. he's like one of those rare people that I think in some ways totally not, like he was kind of a, cat and a cheater but that also in some ways he's like an incredibly moral person right. and I just right. think that yeah I'm very interested in that idea of nuance and yeah. things aren't like left or right or black or white and it's and I think I was super interested in that when I was specifically working on this show so it yeah. seemed like a perfect <laughs> yeah. perfect title that hit on a lot of marks well hopefully it'll come to the opening I know oh my god I would love that <laughs> he's like 90 or something he's still acting and yeah. papers for <laughs> <I know. laughs> A solo exhibition of Andrea McGinty's work titled Clint Eastwood opens at Sunny Gallery in New York on February 10th. The following conversation with Liz Chittister took place in Roxbury, New York on January 2nd, 2022. Mm. Liz Chidester is a Virginia-born singer and songwriter. Her music, grounded in Americana, or American Roots music, combines elements of folk, rock, and rhythm and blues to reflect on family origins, heartbreak, and one's place in the world. I realize you don't have to be from Appalachia to be a folk singer, but does it help to be from a place like Virginia? I think so. I think that you have the scenery, if anything, <laughs> just to inspire you. The daily life, uh, you kind of feel connected to something from, uh, from the past. And also just the people all around you. Uh, they kind of feed your, your curiosity and, and, and they give you stories from mm -hmm. those times too. So. Mountain sides, rolling back, slayed all the tracks, not knowing what was on the other side. Did you grow up in the mountains in a rural place? I did. I grew up in Virginia and also North Carolina, mm -hmm. like in the mountain regions, like in rural mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, interacting with a lot of people that grew up there generationally um, is kind of where I got curious about, about that kind of history too. Who knows where I'll see you on the ride. It occurs to me that the accent is important, a particular accent for folk music, like Gregory Allen Isakoff comes from South Africa, but he's one yeah. of the best folk singers, and he probably had to learn that sort of particular American accent. Oh, totally. And your ear just gets attuned to it, and especially like, I slip into it if I'm talking to somebody from that region. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when I talk to my family from Buffalo, New York, same kind of thing. Oh, the city. Glowing wishes in the wishing well. 
Does your family play music? My family definitely sings. Uh, everybody has like perfect pitch, which is kind of interesting. But I'm the first like of like my family background that really, I, I don't know, has like invested my life into music. Well, then tell me about influences then. I mean, what kinds of music did you listen to uh, that led to where you are? In my mom's side of the family, we, we gathered around a fire and, and would sing songs together. Mm -hmm. That was something that we did every holiday, something we still do. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of how we kept that sort of familial music mm -hmm. um, alive in us. But that's where my musical influences came from was uh, like Neil Young and, and Bob Dylan and kind of those protest folk singers. Right. That's like, mm -hmm. and like old, old time country, things like that. Does your family have the politics that goes with that? I mean, it was sort of... One side of the family, yes. Oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> the other it's... side, pretty much the polar opposite. Yeah, so, it's, the true, yeah. it's the true American family right now, I think. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a little taste of both, and you have to kind of... Which, which one do you get together with during the holidays <laughs> anymore? <laughs> but yeah, um, and that's, yeah, that's been a little hard, because I, I still, I love everybody. It's just, right. it's hard to, you, ha you don't touch certain subjects. I know there's some family I haven't seen for, for years, mm -hmm. you know, because of that too. Mm -hmm. um, and you could kind of feel those seeds growing even like 10 years ago, like in us and kind of in our country too. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand how people from common backgrounds, specific family common backgrounds, can be so split over the political scene right now. And I, I puzzle all the time about how that actually happens. Is it brought about by sort of news feeds and people are only getting one side or the other or is it just a sort of inclination, cultural inclinations perhaps, uh, rural, urban? I think rural, urban has more to yeah. do with everything because I thought maybe it was like north-south but my family being from the north and then kind of marrying southerners, mm -hmm. it just feels like whom they're around and kind of what they're attracted to and, and lifestyle has really influenced the everything more than, mm -hmm. than anything. And I was always attracted to urban living simply because of, of culture and, and just being around right. you know, the arts. Mm -hmm. um, so that gave me an entirely different perspective of the world. The music kind of seeps in. I mean, especially song lyrics, you can be really loving a tune and thinking about it and then only eventually realize that the lyrics are really meaningful to you at a particular moment in your life like it sort of came in the back door absolutely and yeah i because i i love lyrics so much i sometimes mm -hmm. forget that people don't most people don't really listen to them or read them mm -hmm. um or that music is something that is a background thing and not so not necessarily something they're truly like their mind is attached to so mm -hmm. Even just having them, bringing awareness of the music that they already love that may have even like poetry that's inside of it that has a message that maybe they need to hear mm -hmm. is, is something that, uh, that I think might even push the needle a little bit too. You shouldn't have to fight for why I am fighting to know how And there's all these old like folk songs mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily uh, politically leaning a certain way, I would say. Right, right. They might be a little more open-minded than, uh, than others. That maybe they just don't even realize. Yeah, no, a lot of those old songs, like the Leuven Brothers songs, like cautionary tales of, you know, I killed my girlfriend in a fit of rage, don't do what I did, and a lot of kind of Christian overtones of, of um, moralism and you know, don't drink, you know, try to oh, lead yeah. a good Christian life. I mean, those are the common values that we're all coming from in a certain way. There's verses that have been cut from certain songs, mm -hmm. you know, or just that are not a part. Like, a, I think about like, this land is your land, mm -hmm. like the last two verses mm -hmm. that are never sung. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just even bringing awareness that like, hey, you've been singing this song since you were a little kid, but like, you know, this song is about capitalism and, and who owns the land and who right. actually, you know, is this land made for you and me? That, that sort mm -hmm. of question. Breaks the song apart. When Absolutely. you get to that, yeah. But those, you know, 
they're not really uh, brought to the forefront, especially in public schools. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You wrote a song, you write a lot of your own music, and one of the songs that I heard recently was uh, about millennials. I always have felt like I'm a little bit on the outside looking in. Uh, it, even like 10 years ago, uh, when we were um, occupying Wall Street, <laughs> I was uh, working on a cruise ship at the time. So I was like watching everything on the news and, and kind of observing my generation just, you know, like we left college without jobs or without a sense of like, what do our lives look like right now? I found that like writing music is a way for me to to not only yet yeah, kind of look from the outside in but to take the camera lens and go okay well how how am I actually fitting in that am I a part of that mm -hmm. that uh, sort of lost generation how are we finding ourselves mm -hmm. it's a pretty denigrated generation I don't know that it the, it necessarily should be in some ways. I mean, I think it's the older, older generation's uh, plural perspective on how kids are behaving today. But in some ways, you know, it's prescient of people finding new ways to exist or to participate in politics or to make a living or not make such a big living. I mean, I think there's a different attitude toward all of these things. Yeah, so I think that the breaking apart isn't a bad thing. I, I, I just think maybe even my generation was in the middle of, of that stage of, mm -hmm. of like, of that question. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think even like the generation coming up right now, it's like they've learned from that question that maybe they need to, if they are going to school, actually go to school because they want to learn something and want to develop something mm -hmm. rather than it just being mm -hmm. just What you're because. supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah. But I think the millennials were already sort of disillusioned with the previous behaviors questioning it. Now there's like real world events that will probably make sense of those behaviors in a different way. Absolutely. I'm like excited to see what happens. Let's, let's talk about the business of music. Um, musicians have to do a lot of things to make a living. I mean, the record industry is one situation where, where it doesn't support musicians very well or only certain people are supported very well by it. But all the different kinds of things you do as a musician, um, for example, working on cruise ships, do you want to sure. talk about some of those things? Sure. The cruise ships in particular. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I did that in my early 20s, and, and it felt like a, a good time to do that. It, it was a good way to like see the world and just you mm -hmm. know establish like a, a kind of fund where I could give myself a little freedom to mm -hmm. try things. But I also feel that being an educator is is also doing that too. Like I, I always knew that I wanted to teach as well as perform. Mm -hmm. um, so I've actually found that that, that has been, uh, for the past maybe like decade or so, uh, been like my other half of my income. And it's fed like a different part of my, my soul even, I, I didn't expect. I think that it gives you a different perspective on the way that you even perform because I feel a connection with another human being. I feel like I'm the most present when I'm teaching. I mm -hmm. feel like it's actually like making me a better musician Mm -hmm. a better actor because of that presence. You sing uh, cover tunes, mm -hmm. a favorite artist, for a long time before you start to kind of evolve past their style of doing it. You find your own voice, I guess, in that process. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And Do you as remember a, as when that happened for you? Or? As a little kid, I really tried to sound like everybody else. Like my voice teachers would call me the parrot because I would <laughs> impersonate every singer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, I, uh, and I was a little wary of that in the sense that like, you know, I would be scrutinized for doing that. Um, and now I find that like, now there's just a lot of different voices inside of my own voice. And the more that I'm just feeling my own voice inside of my body rather than listening to my voice as I sing, it's like, it's enriched and given it all these different dynamics. And mm -hmm. now I feel like I can do a lot of different styles and that I'm finding my own voice through that. And at the same time, you probably don't need to develop some massive affectation, like, you know, to be completely unique. I mean, you can fit into a, category of singer but have your own phrasing and absolutely addiction. like tone it, right right 
having your own accent on things. But yeah, the, the affectation sometimes naturally happens, unfortunately. It occurs to me when I watch someone like you perform, especially solo, that there's a kind of paradox in the fact that you're presenting something that is very deeply you, like a song you've written, and you're there kind of vulnerable to it, and it's probably personal in, in terms of the subject matter. But then, at the same time, are you able to kind of hide behind the persona of, of performing? Is there something that you feel like protects you from, from that sort of uh, exposure you're offering to the audience? I actually feel like while the guitar is a tool, and I'm, I love that I have it as a tool mm. to be able to write songs and be able to express myself, I definitely feel like it is almost a barrier. So when I sing without it, I really feel vulnerable, the mm -hmm. most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's even like physically protecting like my stomach. It's such right. a weird thing to, to think about it in that way. But right. like, but yeah, that's almost like that's my that's my shield. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I sweat you out of me. Liz Chittister's latest album, titled "Other Side of the Darkest Timeline," was released last fall and is available on Spotify and at Bandcamp. How did I get used to you? Why didn't we make it? Words I told.